Welcome everybody to How I Do It, a short segment tutorial featuring leaders in the endoscopic spine surgery community discussing interesting topics that affect our practice. I am neurosurgeon Dr. Paul Houle, and today we will be discussing hard cases such as foraminal stenosis with Dr. Alfonso Garcia, an orthopedic surgeon from Tijuana, Mexico. So let's get to it. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. How are you today? Hi, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for having Hi, me. Hi, Paul. Thank you. So Thank you for having me. I'm really me. excited to have Dr. Garcia here because he's an outstanding uh, orthopedic surgeon who has very extensive training in endoscopic spine surgery. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your training? Thank you, Paul. I spent a year in Korea at Woodidul uh, Hospital under the uh, guidance and careful teachings of my uh, mentor, Dr. Gun Choi. Excellent. So, um, you know, we've taught a lot together and um, I've watched uh, how skilled you are in the lab and um, you also do a very good job using the shrill, which was our topic last week. But today you have a little presentation about a very common pathology that we all treat and, and how you dealt with it endoscopically. So why don't you go ahead and uh, show us what you did. Yes, let's get started. Yes, let's get started. Foraminal stenosis, and as you will see, it's a very interesting case of a 70-year-old male with past history of heart problems, so he wears presently a pacemaker. Priorly, uh, he had a lumbar disc replacement surgery at L45 and L5S1, and then uh, he went to another country because the chief complaint remained, so they decided to do a fusion surgery from L4 to S1. Both surgeries resulted to be unsuccessful. He didn't get any complaints, I mean, any complications out of both surgeries, fortunately, but the symptoms persisted. So when I first saw him, he was already eight months after the last surgery, and he was still complaining of right buttock and leg pain following L4 and L5 dermatomes, and also a little bit of numbness and gait disturbance secondary to the same uh, symptoms. So this is his pain chart. As so you can see, uh, the dermatomes are very uh, clear, the uh, in involvement of L4 and L5 uh, levels. So on physical, we uh, did uh, find dysesthesia following the same pain pattern, no muscle weakness. This is very important, no muscle weakness, positive L uh, straight leg test, and uh, bilateral S1 deep tendon reflex absent. So on the pre-op images, uh, we see a little bit of artifact uh, coming in from the pedicle screws and also from the artificial disc there. But we, we were uh, still able to see the, the diameter of the foramen, both of L4 and L5. So I decided to go a little bit further and use the uh, multiplanner uh, tool from my uh, image viewer. So uh, the pictures you're looking at right now are both related to L4 and L5 foramen, but the cut uh, you will see is done a little bit obliquely using this uh, tool, which comes in very handy. And as you can see there, the uh, L4 foramen is a little bit more tighter than the L5. On the L5, we do see a little bit of room for that nerve root. Uh, with this images and the uh, 3D reconstruction, as you can see right there, the animated reconstruction, we are better able to uh, assess both uh, foramens. So with that in mind, I decided to go a little bit further and do a diagnostic block on two levels. So on day one, I did a right side L4 transforaminal diagnostic block, which the patient refers that uh, he had pain relief for at least eight to 12 hours. So he came back the next day and then we did L5 transforaminal right side 
uh, diagnostic block, and he didn't experience any significant changes from so what that do you second block. Feel the importance of the diagnostic so, block is yes. It's it's very important tool to to have in, and uh, I see a lot more. Uh, it, it is it is more useful when the surgeon is able to do it on its own because you're better uh, able to. Uh, uh, interpret the uh, findings. I do uh, tell my patient what is he or she going to experience after the uh, nerve block and what we're looking for. So that way he is better uh, able to uh, tell us the important information that we need to decide. In this case, I needed to decide if I had to decompress both foramens or just one foramen. Excellent. No, go ahead. So I went ahead. Yes. Oh, so I went ahead and planned for a transforaminal endoscopic lumbar foraminotomy just on right side on L4 level. So this is the uh, surgical video I made for you. So we see the images, the pre-op images coming in from the uh, fluoroscope. So as you can see, there's a lot of hardware there that uh, actually makes it more difficult to identify the, the medial pedicle wall there, which is the limit on how far you need to go with the trephine. So in this case, I went up until the yellow trephine and then I finished my foraminotomy uh, while uh, looking directly uh, through my endoscope. So as you can see, there's, there's bone everywhere. Uh, you can identify the, uh, the pedicle right there on your left side and the SAP on top but still on, on the bottom of that screen, uh, on the medial side, you can, see, you can see just bone. So I tested there with my shrill to see how thick that bone wall was. So I decided to go towards the exiting nerve root and find uh, some space between that bone wall and the exiting L4 nerve root. So I did find some space there. I'm building some space, dissecting with the uh, ball probe, which is a very handy tool. And uh, you should be very careful in performing this dissection because the nerve root is already tight. So that gave me a lot of uh, uh, security that I was uh, not uh, putting so much pressure on the exiting nerve root. Now, remember, the patient is awake and under conscious sedation, so he'll be able to tell me if he is experiencing any... Uh, uh, abnormal sensation on his uh, and I right know you, you're leg. of the same opinion as I am. So is that, I, you know, you, doing this under constant sedation, this is the best neuromonitoring you can possibly have. I know there are some surgeons who are reluctant to perform this uh, procedure uh, under constant sedation and prefer general anesthesia with with neuromonitoring. But in my opinion, I think this is far safer for the patient to do it under constant sedation. I agree. Totally agree. It, it is. I love it. That's the uh, traversing root coming into view there. So I, I use. Yes, that's the traversing nerve root on the bottom of your screen. And I use the uh, kerosene and sometimes I switch to the uh, trephine. I mean, to the shrill just to uh, pick up the pace. So you can see the fully decompressed L5 traversing nerve root. And then on, on the uh, right side, the uh, decompressed L4 exiting nerve root. So this is a, a picture composition, a picture collage that I made out of the uh, endoscopic video views. So fully decompressed uh, L5 nerve root and L4 nerve root. So uh, post-op pick, uh, satisfied and happy patient. He went uh, uh, on the next day because he was, he was he's actually originally from Canada, so he had to catch a flight next day. Patient, no pain, walking without uh, no aid. So lessons learned from this case. Uh, use trephines with cautions. You don't need to go all the way up to the red trephine. If you have room with just the green, stay with the green, and then use your shrill with uh, direct uh, visualization to fully decompress the area in which you want to make more space so start dissecting in in, in very uh, 
stenotic cases, severe cases, the one that, that you just saw, start dissecting close to the exiting nerve roots. Take your time and make some space for the exiting nerve root and then complete the foramenotomy from the exiting nerve root towards the uh, pedicle. And uh, the end point should be when you verify the pulsating traversing nerve root and exiting nerve root. Well, that's an absolutely outstanding presentation and treating a very uh, difficult problem uh, with spinal endoscopy. Uh, to, to recap, I mean, I think clearly here's a pathology that I think is begging for treatment with endoscopy. Would you agree? I agree. Yes, definitely. And in this case, it would have been a lot easier. This is the uh, easiest uh, approach. We, uh, you, you mentioned uh, earlier off the air that uh, we could use two, but still it would be a, a pretty large uh, surgery and difficult with all the hardware and bone uh, from the uh, prior surgeries. So uh, I know you, uh, you practice in Tijuana. Uh, you have a private clinic. Um, the name of your private clinic is what? Yes, my office is inside another a big corporate hospital, which is Hospital Ángeles de Tijuana. And uh, you can find me on the web pay, on, on the web, like uh, MK, uh, M, I'm sorry, mkspinehealth.com, mkspinehealth.com, which is a very friendly web page. You can register there and uh, receive all, all my blogs and you can cut contact me there through a, a chat a window that opens up when you uh, click on my web page, or you can send me a direct uh, email from the uh, contact uh, menu. Excellent. Well, yes. once again, thank you, Dr. Garcia. I do have a lot of videos shared on my web page. I do have a lot of videos from uh, different cases on my web page that you can look well, at. I'd like to thank you again for taking the time out of your day to share some of your experiences with us. Uh, and for the viewers out there, uh, thank you for watching. If you have any suggestions of further topics you'd like to see covered, please uh, reach me uh, via email or text or messenger or whatever. I'd be happy to cover them. Uh, until next time, uh, everyone stay safe and healthy.